Well, my dudes, I just completed the prologue for the long-anticipated Half-Life fan game Project Borealis, and as a huge fan of the series, I'd like to discuss it. Now, I initially wrote a preamble on why I love these games and how they've profoundly impacted my life, but I decided to cut it for the sake of keeping this focused on the main subject. So Project Borealis is a fan-made adaptation of Epistle 3, a blog post written in 2017 by former Valve writer Mark Laidlaw. Long story short, Epistle 3 is a lengthy synopsis of a draft of Half-Life 2 Episode 3's story, the names of prominent characters slightly altered, presumably for copyright reasons. Here's my opinion. I think it's completely fucking bonkers, and if it was intended to be the final draft of Episode 3, I don't know whether people would have loved it or hated it. Alex kills Mossman, the Combine homeworld is surrounded by Dyson Spears, and Breen was turned into a slug? What? I guess this line near the end of Half-Life 2 makes more sense now. Fans immediately started working on Epistle 3 inspired games, and from the ashes rose Boreal Aleph and Project Borealis, both large scale attempts at adapting the material, but with different objectives. Boreal Aleph was a loose interpretation built on the Source engine, and turned out the way most ambitious fan projects do, i.e., it's still being updated and set to release sometime in the near future. No, of course not. It was cancelled. This leaves us with Project Borealis, a more faithful interpretation developed in Unreal Engine 5 by Icebreaker Industries. And now, seven years after its announcement and four years since its last progress update, we finally have a playable demo. Hooray! What's that? It's only eight minutes long? Okay. Okay, I hope it still whets my appetite for the full release. Eh. Needless to say, eh, was not my expected reaction. So I posted a screenshot with the caption, put back in the oven, chef, it's still raw, and went to bed. Maybe I'm just being overdramatic, I mused while embracing my head crab pillow. So I replayed it the following day, and good news, I'm not crazy. The bad news is that I had the same reaction. Eh. Right, so let's get this out of the way. Yes, I understand this is a volunteer project, and yes, I understand this prologue is more of a vertical slice than a demo, made obvious by the fact that you're just playing through an altered version of Ravenholm's opening section. That said, I still feel it's important to give feedback at this stage of development. And besides, I have plenty of good things to say about it too, starting with how well it recreates Half-Life's iconic HUD. I've always loved the easy readability of Half-Life's HUD, how your ammo and health bars are positioned right near the crosshair. You're instantly notified of your current status while still being able to see what you're shooting at, even during the more intense firefights. It's UI perfection and should be shown in graphic design classes, or at the very least, beamed from a projector into Ubisoft's headquarters. In here, the HUD is so faithfully recreated that if I were to show you a screenshot of the game without mentioning it was made in UE5, you'd probably say, wow, that's an incredible looking source mod. Oh, and you'd better believe Icebreaker carried over that same gray utilitarian options menu, though thankfully the game doesn't stu 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 stutter whenever you change a setting. I was initially concerned when I heard Project Borealis was being developed in UE5, my mind conjuring up disturbing images of a Half-Life game bathed in garish post-processing effects. That's not the case, thankfully. It takes advantage of UE5's visual fidelity while still maintaining Half-Life's clean art direction, but it also ventures into surreal territory with its oddly ethereal depiction of a post-Citadel explosion Ravenholm. The zombie-infested town has had a bit of a makeover since Half-Life 2, now rotting under a heavy blanket of snow and torn apart by cosmic holes in reality. It's mainly an excuse to show off the lighting and physics, but it works on its own as a dreamlike set piece, a glimpse into a timeline where Ravenholm has succumbed to the elements, both natural and supernatural. It's a game that looks great in screenshots and trailers, and then you actually play it. <laughs> Yeah, it's rough. I won't say it's bad, but it's, uh... It's rough. Here's what the shotgun sounds like in Half-Life 2. Now here's what it sounds like in Project Borealis. Man, that's so weak. I'm sorry, Project Borealis, but I don't care how detailed your snow textures are if your weapons sound like this. 
Half-Life is a series that lives and dies on its sound design. And while we often refer to the ambience when we say that, it applies to the weapons too. It's an FPS for crying out loud. Take a look at Half-Life 2's arsenal. Every weapon has a distinct and satisfying sound, from the gentle hum of the gravity gun to the cathartic boom of the shotgun. But in Project Borealis, the sound design is so anemic that it just feels like you're using airsoft guns. They're all so stiff and weightless, which is made worse by the game's lackluster visual feedback. You can still cleave zombies in half with the gravity gun, but when you remove all the blood effects and make the gravity gun sound like this... Well, it's hard to find any joy or catharsis in launching saws around, and that's half the fun of using the gravity gun. Meanwhile, this is what it's like in Half-Life 2. BAM! That's how you do it! And it's all the little details together that make this so damn satisfying. The thunderous boom of the gravity gun as you launch the saw. The blood shooting out as the torso splits from the legs, followed by the meaty thud of it hitting the ground. Let's play that again, shall we? Now let's go back to Project Borealis. That didn't look like I was cutting something in half, it looked like I was knocking over a mannequin. I hate to be pedantic, but these details matter in the long run, especially when the completed game could potentially be several hours long. If I'm already not having fun with the weapons in a demo that's roughly 8 minutes long, that's a bad sign. The zombie AI is also spotty, with them frequently getting stuck on corners and crates and unable to hit me when I'm slightly above them. Oh, and I really dislike this violent screen shake whenever a zombie hits you. Yes, I understand this was also in Half-Life 2, but it wasn't nearly as disorienting. Take a look. I'm not usually the type of person who complains about this stuff, but I think an option to disable this would be perfect, especially for people who are more prone to motion sickness. To be clear, none of these issues alone would be deal breakers, but all of them combined left me walking away from Project Borealis with conflicted thoughts. Like an extremely fragile Lego set, it's fun to admire from afar, but try to play with it and it just falls apart. But to end this on a positive note, this is still an impressive showing for a volunteer project, and beneath all of its flaws, I can tell it was made by people who deeply love the series. If Icebreaker Industries is watching this video, well, I hope I didn't come across as a nitpicking asshole, but more importantly, I wish you all the luck in the world, because I can't imagine how daunting it is to work on a project of this scale and ambition. I look forward to playing, and reviewing, the full game when it's ready to go. Gordon? Anyway, I gotta start working on the cartel review, okay bye!